Welcome back everybody. We are here for another encore performance from a wonderful author, Mark Love. He writes really cool mysteries. It's so much fun. And I love having authors back a second, third, fourth, fifth time because uh, it's just it's just too much fun for me. Welcome back, Mark. Well, thank you, Diana. It's always a pleasure to chat with you. I'm so glad you came back. Um, we're going to do lots of these because you have lots of books. <laughs> I didn't know if that was uh, a, a blessing or a curse, but yes, I would like to come back and, and do a little reading from each one of them. Right now, I've I would love that. Six novels and the Let's novella. Let's just keep that we did. signing you up and bringing you back. You're going to make me keep writing too. So that's yeah, that's, that's the good. goal. Because you know, it's completely selfish on my part. You know, I invite you back so that I can make you write more. That's that's how I do that. Well, I, I figure once I start reading aloud what I've written, then you're going to get hooked and you're going to go out and buy a copy of it anyway. I've been doing that. <laughs> <laughs> My problem is not having enough hours in the day. What I'd like to do is have you just, you know, show up for six hours and read the entire book. <laughs> we'll, we'll have to talk about that. Yeah. Uh, you know, <laughs> see what we can work out here. Awesome. So... so Mark lived for many years in the metropolitan Detroit area where crime and corruption are always prevalent. We're so lucky. Uh, as a former freelance reporter, Mark honed his writing skills covering features and hard news. He is the author of the Jamie Richmond romance series, Devious, Vanishing Act, and Fleeing Beauty, and the novella Stealing Haven. The short story, Don't Mess with the Gods, was written with Ellie Ali Nina Kessel, yeah. um, and she was included, and and the story was included in the Magic and Mischief anthology. Mark also wrote the Jefferson Shane mystery series, including what he's going to read today, Y319 and Your Turn to Die. The latest Shane novel, The Wayward Path, has just recently been released. Mark now resides in West Michigan, where he enjoys a wide variety of music, books, travel, cooking, and the great outdoors when he's not writing. <laughs> Personally, stop doing that other stuff. Just lock yourself in a room and write. Yeah, I, as long <laughs> as I can figure out some way of getting food and water delivered, you know, I'd be all set. Right. You know? That's always the trouble for some parts. That's a challenge. Gotta so get a today, little bit here yeah, today you're going to be reading from your mystery, Y319. A serial killer is on the loose in Metro Detroit. Three female victims have been discovered in motel rooms in different suburban cities surrounding Motown. The only connection is that each body is found in room 319, and the killer leaves the taunting message Y319 on the bathroom mirror written with the victim's lipstick. Detective Jefferson Shane heads up an elite squad of detectives assigned to the case. With no home life, he devotes every waking moment to catching killers, but this one is more elusive than most. With no clues and no apparent link between the victims, Shane is at a dead end. But a startling res revelation busts the case wide open. He's closing in on the murderer, but will it be before another young woman loses her life? So much fun. I am really looking forward to this one. Okay, everybody, grab the edge of your seat. Hold on tight. And Mark, when you are ready, please read aloud. All right. As Gleason used to say, and away we go. Away we go. All right. Uh, this one starts out with a prologue. It was almost becoming too easy. They were everywhere. One plain Jane after another kept crossing my radar screen. Some nights it was like shopping for bananas and they were visible in bunches. Tonight was one of those nights. It was as if someone were holding up a sign, steering them in my direction, like right now. Off to the left at one of those elevated stations, where you had to sit on a bar stool in order to reach the table were two perfect physical examples of the ideal target. Four women, each in their early to mid twenties were crowded around the postage stamp size table. 
I ruled two out immediately. They were chunky, flashing lots of cleavage with large breasts. For a nanosecond, I wondered if the flesh was real or the results of surgical enhancement. It didn't matter. They were unworthy of any further consideration. But it was the other two who caught my eye. The one on the right was a bottled blonde, which was obvious by the dark roots showing and the dark eyebrows. The other was a brassy redhead. She was tiny, almost doll-like. I was in a perfect position to observe her. She was wearing high-heeled red boots that came up over her knee, sassy-looking things that accentuated her legs. Her black skirt barely touched the middle of her thighs, but it might have been longer if she was standing up. She wore a heavy ivory-colored wool sweater that covered her from the throat to the waist. It was loose enough to keep the goodies beneath it a well-guarded secret. With the boots and the short skirt, she was almost too good to be true. And upon reflection, I realized she was. Her attitude was a turnoff. This was a girl who flaunted the little bits she had. As she sat on the stool, swaying to the background music, she kept crossing and uncrossing her legs, putting on a floor show of her own. Her hands were constantly in motion. Now they were slowly, seductively sliding down her arms, dropping below the table into her lap. They lingered for a moment, then skittered down her legs to tug at the bottom of her skirt. This was no timid child. She was well aware of her body. By the way she was moving, she knew how to use it. My focus returned to the bottled blonde. This one had potential. Her wardrobe was the polar opposite of the redhead. She wore loose fitting slacks with low heeled shoes that would have been rejected by a nun with an orthopedic condition and a blouse buttoned to the neck with a jacket to help conceal her. The only thing that broke the mold for this plain Jane was the hair color. Upon a closer look, it was blonde highlights swirled in with a natural brown, a shade best described as mousy. Perhaps she was letting it grow out after getting it dyed for the holidays. What would she look like sprawled naked on a bed, unable to resist, unable to stop, unable to do anything at all. My body began to respond. My heart rate kicked up a notch. A warm glow started in the pit of my stomach and eased out in every direction. I basked in the tremors of anticipation. My cheeks flushed with beads of perspiration. Yes, she could very easily be the next one. But first, the stage had to be set, and it was a time for patience. The plans were perfection, which was evident by the lack of awareness of the public or any progress by the police. Those bumblers in blue would never put it together because of the meticulous planning. If by chance they somehow managed to get a clue, the misdirection was already in place. So there could be no deviation from the plan. It had taken weeks of study, of strategizing each and every move. Every step was plotted out. Every move was a smooth choreographed motion. Every action triggered the next in a series of reactions. Just reflecting on the past efforts was enough to make me smile. The memory of my last victim, her limp body slowly cooling as the life force ebbed away, was enough to bring a smile of triumph to my lips. What the hell are you grinning at? The band's drummer, Malcolm, asked as he stepped up. Just thinking about how good a night this will be, I said. I don't want a bumpy ride tonight. I turned and looked him right in the eye. You got nothing to worry about, man. 
everything will be smooth. Malcolm hesitated a moment as he studied me, then nodded in agreement. We can't ever be too smooth. My, my smile widened. That's me, man. I'm too smooth. I am elusive. I am a cold, calculating, efficient machine. No computer can analyze my moves and predict when and where the next victim will be found. No one can determine the motives that lay beneath the actions. Only someone who has lived in my body, had the same experiences, the same influences, the same events coursing through their veins would have even the slightest glimmer of a possibility of figuring this out. I'm too smooth, I said softly, closely studying the reflection in the mirror. That smooth spelled with 17 O's. Everything was moving forward according to plan. The next victim was being developed, that timid one with the blonde highlights from the bar last week. She was so uncertain of herself. It was as if a strong wind could change the direction of her focus. Her name was Melissa. She was a preschool teacher, helping four and five-year-olds learn their colors and the alphabet. For a moment, I wondered if that had been the extent of Janet's own knowledge. She certainly hadn't appeared to be experienced in the ways of the world when it came to dating. Of course, she needn't worry about dating any longer now that she was dead. It had almost been too easy to cut her from her small group of friends at the bar. With the crowd noise, the interactions of both men and women, reveling in the music, the booze, the pheromones, and the physical contact, it was only a matter of paying attention, of waiting for the right moment to pick her off. Each of her three friends was drawn to the dance floor where the press of bodies was intense. Melissa, my dear, you were about to discover the world of excitement, a world of romance, of passion, of intensity that you could never imagine. That's waiting for you. And I intend to be the one to introduce you to it. I spun from the mirror and snapped off the lights. Game on. Chapter one. You never really get used to the smell of a dead body. It's that thick, ghastly odor that attacks the nasal passages and stubbornly clogs the back of your throat and just hangs there. It lingers, waiting, like some sadistic culinary delight that you really don't want to sample. The temperature in the room was hot, which would expedite the decomposition process. The gases inside the body were already starting to decay. That was the stench that assaulted me the second I crossed the threshold of the motel room. Two crime scene technicians were already at work. One was busy with a video camera filming the details. The other was making notes and dusting surfaces for fingerprints. Standing in the outer hallway were two uniformed police officers and a detective in a gray flannel suit. As I was taking in the details of the room, I felt a finger prod my spine, just below the shoulder blades. Hey, Kaz, I said without flinching. There was a chuckle in the deep voice behind me. Damn, Shane, you must be a great detective. You never even turned around. I inclined my head towards a small oval mirror on the opposite wall. Sometimes you make it too easy. Anyone else get the call? Nah, you figure it's the same guy? Hard to say, but it's got the right feel to it. They haven't given the media the specifics yet, so we can rule out a copycat. Kaz nodded as the guy in the gray flannel appeared in the doorway. The suit was badly wrinkled. The guy was in dire need of a shave. He was about five foot 10 with curly black hair framing his head. He followed him across the hall to another room and waited while he closed the door behind us. 
Kaz slumped into one of the upholstered chairs. I leaned against the wall. Name's Costello. I was just going off duty when we got the call from the hotel manager. I've got two detectives on a stakeout, one on vacation, and another out with appendicitis. This just isn't going to be my day. We did the business card exchange. His had the Bloomfield logo in the background, Sergeant Norman Costello. I doubted that the state of Michigan shield on our cards impressed him. I didn't really care. He gave the cards a quick once over, then looked up quickly. Jefferson Shane? Isn't that an intersection downtown? Reluctantly, I nodded. I'm Shane, that's Kozlowski. Kaz is easier on the tongue. What made you think to call us? Costello pulled a pack of cigarettes from his shirt pocket and looked at us briefly. Kaz raised his hands, palm up. I merely nodded. It took him three tries to get a match lit. He took a deep drag before answering. Saw the notice from the top yesterday. There have been two other killings in the metro area in the last two months. Both fit the same description. Young females, slender build, with no evidence of drug use. Both found nude, spread eagle on the bed. Sexual activity evident, but it's uncertain as to whether it was pre or post-mortem or both. Cause of death appears to be suffocation. Costello rubbed his left hand across his face. It looks like he used the pillow. No apparent struggle, no signs of forced entry. How long you been here, Kaz asked. Costello checked his watch. About 45 minutes. We're lucky that the room is on the end of a hallway. I put one uniform on the door, another at the end of the corridor to keep any guests out. Called for the evidence techs, then called you guys. Who's the top, I asked. That would be Chief of Police Ryan. Him and the Lady Mayor notified us yesterday. She wanted to make it abundantly clear that we contact the state police immediately. It's almost like she expected us to be involved. This scumbag has committed two other murders, one each in Wayne and Macomb counties. Stand to reason Oakland was due, I said. Yeah, but why couldn't he pick something like Troy or Southfield or even Royal Oak where all the trendsetters are, Costello grumbled. Just lucky, I guess, Cost said. No offense, but we'll have our forensic team join the party. We'll need copies of whatever reports you generate from this investigation. An inch of ash teetered on the tip of Costello's cigarette. He looked around the motel room for an ashtray, then gave up and cupped his palm beneath it. He took another long drag and walked into the bathroom. I could hear the hiss of the ember hitting the water, then the toilet flushed as he got rid of it. He came back in the room, brushing ashes off his hands. You smoke much? Kaz asked as he rose from the chair. I gave it up three years ago. Used to do two packs a day without even thinking about it. So what's with today? Costello gave a reluctant shrug. First homicide I've seen in years. Most of what we get is home invasions. Maybe some snatch and grabs, DUI, that kind of stuff. To make matters worse, she looks like a girl that works as a babysitter in our neighborhood. We don't get homicides out here in the suburbs. Kaz gave him a single nod of understanding. You do now. We gloved up and went back into room 319. Costello remained in the hallway. The room was average size for a motel but not big enough for half a dozen people to be moving around inspecting a crime scene. He conferred with the two uniformed officers out in the hall. Kaz and I took a quick look at the body while the techs hung back. She was a plain girl, not gorgeous, not pretty, but plain. Average looks, the kind of girl you would pass in a store or on the street and wouldn't glance at twice. Once upon a time, she'd had large, dark green eyes. 
Thick brown hair extended just beyond her shoulders. She had a straight up and down figure, a size one or maybe a size two, with small, almost non-existent breasts and a narrow waist. I guessed her to be about five foot three, maybe 90 pounds. I picked up her wrist and slowly rotated the hand. Her skin was clammy in the overheated room. Kaz instructed one of the techs to turn off the heat. Nails were cut, just like the others. He nodded. Not the type of girl to bite them. Check out the polish. Same shade on the toes, and it looks recent. Spent some time making herself look good. Pro? Doubt it. She's probably a career girl. We'll know more from registration. I'm guessing we'll find a car in the lot. I leaned back on my heels, studying her. I knew it was the same guy. It had to be the same guy. I glanced at Kozlowski. He was looking at the wall above the bed. The cream colored paint and wallpaper were immaculate. No splatters of blood. Death must have been quick. No bruising on the body. He was neat and tidy, just like before. I'm guessing he used a douche on her too. Make sure he doesn't leave any DNA. Kaz shook his head in disgust. Guy eaves and shaves off her bush so he doesn't leave any of his hair behind. You never know. Some girls prefer the smooth look. He snorted a laugh. Yeah, like hookers trying to pass for 13. You check? Nah, go ahead. I walked into the bathroom, flicking on the light with the back of my knuckle. It was on the mirror. The message was written in lipstick, the smeary letters almost a foot tall. Acid built in my stomach as I studied the riddle. Why 319? I don't normally spend time gazing upon my reflection in the mirror, but as I had stared at the message and the light-skinned black man staring back at me, I noticed it was written fairly high up on the glass. It was just about eye level on me, so maybe this was a clue to our killer's height. My gaze flicked down. Lying on the counter was the lipstick container. During the investigation, we would learn it was hers. Victim number three. I hadn't asked her name yet, but in the next few days, I would strive to learn everything I could about her. Leaning out toward the room, I hooked a finger at the tech with the camera equipment. Don't forget the bathroom, I said. Get the whole room. Kozlowski was waiting for me in the hallway, snapping off the latex gloves and stuffing them in the pocket of his coat. His blue eyes were cold and hard as he stared past me into the motel room. Same message? Yeah. This guy is starting to piss me off. Me too. You call for Rudy? He nodded. Fenn's going to do the autopsy himself. He's bringing the crew to do the evidence sweep. I asked Costello to get the manager in the details. We turned to see Costello walking down the hall escorting a very pale and timid woman. It was obvious that she was unaccustomed to dead bodies in her motel, and that the last place she wanted to be was anywhere near the victim. Unfortunately, she didn't have much choice. That's the end of chapter one. Thank you so much. You know, every time you read for me, I'm surprised that there's another piece of you I didn't know about. <laughs> I'm not sure if that's a good thing or a bad thing to I reveal think it's right a good now. Thing. For an author, I think it's a compliment. <laughs> well, thank you for that. What was your favorite part about writing this book? I really got roped in to the the idea of of a serial killer and and having the three different counties, the three different suburban cities, because from living in the area and working as a reporter, I know that it's very unusual for the police to share communications with each sure. other. Yeah. So the idea of having, you know, in Wayne County is one crime, in Oakland is another, in Macomb is another, 
And nobody's really aware of the fact that they're dealing with one killer. Each one thinks it's a, it's an independent situation. Sure. And that really sparked my interest when I came up with that idea. And uh, I just had a lot of fun doing that. So. Yeah, sometimes it's fun to be creepy. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for coming back to read. I really had a great time. And and while you were reading, I jumped on Amazon and ordered the book. So thank you so much for that. You're so so welcome. One little thing I just wanted to clarify when you were doing my intro, you were talking about the Jamie Richmond series. Mm -hmm. Those are part mystery, part romance, not complete romance. Right, Uh, right. So I just wanted to clarify that because I was told with a last name of love, I have to have some romance in my story. <laughs> well, you write them very well. And I thought, so. okay, we'll give it a try. So. Well, you succeeded, definitely. Very good. Anybody who hasn't read the Jamie Richmond series really needs to because they're expertly done. Thank so. you for that. I'm super so. impressed. Thank you so much for coming back. You'll come back again for another book, right? I, I certainly will, and I always enjoy getting together with you, Diana. We have such a good time talking before and after we get started with these things. It's so much fun. It so. is. It is. I'm glad you came back again. I look forward All to right. doing it um, again and again. As do I. And again. As do I. And again and again and again. <laughs> I'll just keep coming up with them. Just so. keep writing. We'll keep doing it. Very Thank good. you so much. Have an awesome day. Thank you, Diana. You too.